Carrying on with our thinking about the systemic effect of burns, we're coming to C for circulation. Now, burns are very insulting wounds, and there's a lot of inflammatory mediators released from damaged tissues and insulted tissues around the area of a burn. So histamine, serotonin, prostaglandins, of course, complement, kyanins, a lot of pro-inflammatory mediators are going to be released from a burn. And these pro-inflammatory mediators lead to what is called capillary leak syndrome. So as you probably know, we have capillaries, small blood vessels, individual vascular endothelial cells comprising the wall of the capillaries. And this is true to the uh, arterioles, the venules, the very small vessels, very thin walls. The arterioles will have a bit of a smooth muscle around the outside. And the, the blood, of course, goes through these very often only one red cell at a time, perfusing the tissue. Now, when we get these inflammatory mediators, when the inflammatory mediators are acting on the capillaries, so there's damage tissue and there's going to be the release of inflammatory mediators in the tissues, then what happens is these capillaries greatly dilate there's actually two things happen. There's dilation of the uh, small blood vessels like the arterioles and the, the venules and the capillaries. But also the inflammatory mediators actually cause the cells themselves to get smaller and fatter. They actually contract. This is, this is a very much a deliberate, deliberate process. So what we have is that the capillaries dilate. Cells get smaller and we can see that this capillary is now quite a bit wider than it was prior to being exposed to the inflammatory mediators. Now typically the larger gaps here are not big enough to let the red cells out. They still stay in typically unless it's uh, very severe. They normally stay in. But it lets all the other uh, bits and bobs out. So it lets out all the um, tissue fluids. Basically all the components of the blood that aren't the red cells can get out. So we can get uh, water getting out. We get proteins. We get the, uh, the nutrients. And of course it makes the bigger gaps make it easier for the, for the white blood cells to get out. Particularly thinking about maybe the monocytes and the... Um, the neutrophils, so the leukocytes. Vital, of course, to the uh, protection of the body from infection. So it's a good thing because all these useful things get out. We, we need proteins, we need nutrients, we need, we need water, we need leukocytes to, to help with the healing process. So that, that's good, that causes inflammatory, uh, inflammatory exudate. But this is called um, capillary leak syndrome, that these capillaries become uh, leaky. And uh, what this means is that there's a shift of fluid from here, from inside the uh, intravascular compartment. So that's the intravascular compartment there. Intravascular means inside the vessels. And the fluid instead clecks in the interstitial compartment. The interstitial compartment or the third space. Now this term third spacing. So interstitial compartment is a third spacing effect. Now what this th term third spacing means is that um, the body water, most of the body water is inside the cells. So there's huge amounts of water inside, most of the water in the body is inside the cells. Intracellular compartment. And then the second compartment is the water in the blood, that's the intravascular compartment. 
And then the third compartment or the third space is anything that's not in the cells and not in the blood vessels. So if it's in the tissue spaces, that's in a third space. And the key thing about this is that when fluid is in the third space, it's no longer able to circulate around the blood. And it's, um, it's useless for the purposes of uh, sustaining intravascular volume and blood pressure. Um, now this effect is always there locally. There's always going to be production of tissue fluid locally. And we expect this, of course, this is, this is edema. We get edematous swelling in an injury. But if there's a large burnt area, then the damaged cells and tissues in the burnt area will release inflammatory cytokines locally, of course. We know that because they're the ones that cause the initial vasodilation here. But as well as that, if there's a large area burnt, what we'll get is pro-inflammatory cytokines produced in large volumes. And these will then also go into the systemic circulation and we'll get a, a systemic effect from this. So we'll get a, a systemic capillary leak syndrome all over the place. And the patient will become edematous and around about the area of the burn. Yes, that's true. But also if there's like 20-30% of the body surface area burnt, they're going to become edematous uh, all over the place because of this um, widespread capillary leak syndrome. And the, the bigger the amount of body surface area burnt, of course, the worse this is, this is going to be. And if there's lots of fluid going from the intravascular compartment into the interstitial compartment, there's going to be less fluid left in the intravascular compartment. And of course, if there's less blood in the intravascular compartment, the fluid volumes are low. And that's going to lead to hypovolemia. And hypovolemia, of course, is going to cause shock. Shock is when the blood pressure or the, uh, the state of the circulatory system is so poor it's no longer able to perfuse and oxygenate the tissues. Cause of shock. And that's why these patients, um, patients with um, burns, we get these hypovolemia effects. People with burns are, are very thirsty. Very often the first thing they'll say is, can I have a drink? Because the hypovolemic stimulating the, um, the thirst centers in the hypothalamus. And of course, if there's a reduced blood supply going through the kidneys, reduced renal perfusion, because there's less blood accessing via the renal arterial system. Reduced perfusion, hypoperfusion of the kidneys is going to lead to reduced urine volumes. And of course we have to, assure, we have to assure, um, make sure that we get 0.5 mils of urine per kilogram of the patient's body weight per hour. Um, otherwise we're at risk of a, acute kidney injury, which we certainly don't want. And as well as losing the body's own physiological fluid, in, in large area burns. Um, the capillary leak syndrome can persist for some time and uh, the fluid that we give, 50% of infused fluid is lost into the third space. In the first six to 12 hours, it's worst. Um, and this means that a lot of the fluid we're putting in to maintain intravascular volume is actually going to contribute to the edema. Uh, but we still have to give fluid, of course, because uh, otherwise the patient's going to become hypovolemic, shocked, and they're going to die. And we always need to think about electrolyte disturbance whenever we're thinking about fluids. And when there's injury, in, inside, ce inside cells, there's a lot of potassium. Not so much potassium. I mean, normal serum levels of potassium are uh, 3.5 to 5 millimoles relatively low but inside the cells there's lots of potassium so when cells are injured when the wall of the cell is disrupted 
that potassium can get out. And we're going to get movement of potassium from the intracellular space to the extracellular space where it can circulate. Um, release of intracellular potassium. As you probably know, that can be really quite dangerous because that can lead to hyperkalemia. And rapid changes in potassium are, are life-threatening. They can cause ventricular fibrillation, for example. And we also mentioned that lots of proteins are lost from the intravascular compartment into the, the edema. And uh, this protein loss can lead to hypoproteinemia. Low levels of uh, protein in the blood, particularly the albumin, of course, is the main osmotic protein in the plasma generating oncotic pressure. Um, so we can get reduced plasma oncotic pressure. Now, as you probably know from other videos, the uh, tissue fluid is produced at the arterial end of the capillary because the hydrostatic pressure of the blood is greater than the osmotic pressure. And tissue fluid is reabsorbed at the venous end of the capillary because the oncotic pressure generated by the plasma proteins is greater in the intravascular space than it is in the interstitial space. I'm not going to go into that in great detail here, but that physiology is well covered in this series on um, capillaries. I've covered that in great detail. Um, but if we have reduced amounts of plasma, what it means is um, less tissue fluid is reabsorbed. So normally it's the plasma proteins here that are causing the tissue fluid to be reabsorbed. And if we have lower amounts of plasma proteins here, we're going to reduce the oncotic pressure. Less tissue fluids are going to be reabsorbed. Therefore, more fluid is going to be left in the tissues. So, um, again, that contributes to the, to, to the edema problem in the first, in the initial management of burns. And as we say, the larger the area of burns, the greater this systemic edema problem is going to be with the capillary leak syndrome and the um, hypoalbumin, hypoalbuminemia. So this is 20% uh, burns, this is going to be a problem. 30% burns, certainly, and bigger area burns is, is a massive problem. Smaller burns, the systemic effects are, of course, less. And when the patient's thirsty, we can simply give them drinks of water, which is, which is good. Um, now, I think in circulation, I'll just mention one other thing here. Um, uh, compression effects. So all this edema can cause uh, compression of the, 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 the venous circulation especially. And uh, that can reduce the perfusion locally. So compression effects can reduce perfusion locally. And this is particularly a problem with um, circumferential burns. So if I'm burned all the way around there, then that's going to reduce the circulation uh, to my hand, the circumferential burns. So we need to monitor distal perfusion. And the other big risk with uh, circumferential burns, again, especially if they go all the way around, uh, especially in the, in the limbs, is the risk of uh, compartment syndrome. So we have to look out for um, localised ischemia. And bear in mind the risk of compartment syndrome. In compartment syndrome, of course, there is an increase in pressure in the muscle compartment. Um, that can... Uh, preclude the circulation to that muscle compartment, meaning that the muscle in that compartment will die and uh, it won't recover. So observe for local effects. So we, we, see that we see that we need to observe for local effects and systemic effects, and that when local effects become widespread, the release of the pro-inflammatory cytokines is going to have systemic 
complications.